I'm an internal medicine uh, a physician. I see adult patients, um, but as Thorsten referred to, um, you know, the only kids I talk to are my own, so I will also refer heavily to my series of N equals 3 uh, during this talk, um, you know, because that sort of fits in with the surgical mantra as well, you know, in my experience. But I think what I've learned um, by working with Thorsten was actually listening to patients and what we can learn um, by, by clinical observation, but then taking that clinical observation into the lab, into the animal house, and then back into the clinic to actually do the translational approach. So I'm going to show you some of those insights that we've gained um, by specifically questioning you know, the physiology of weight gain and weight loss. And I'm going to make no excuses for the fact that I come from a very biological approach to this problem, and I'm going to try and, and, and illustrate that with some examples. I start, however, with a slide of this typical patient that come to my clinic, and um, she tells me that her main problem is that uh, she can lose weight anytime she wants. She goes on a diet, she loses lots of weight, but then she becomes hungry. And when she becomes hungry, this little devil is coming around and it's making her do it, you know, and she cannot stop feeling hungry. And I, of course, always challenge you in the audience and say, I will give you a hundred million uh, kroner um, if you can hold your breath for 10 minutes. And all of you are smart enough to hold your breath and all of you would be motivated enough by the money, but at some point, at about a minute or a minute and a half, you're just going to take another breath. Because, of course, your breathing is regulated by your medulla oblongata um, and you cannot use your grey matter to change the physiology of breathing. And in the same way, if we're going to ask these patients to lose weight, if it's under physiological control, it is no surprise that we can make people lose weight, but we cannot maintain the weight loss very easily if we don't change the signals. Another thing just to, to link in with today's talk, we have recognized just through clinical um, observation, the most predictive factor of coming into an adult obese clinic is if you saw a dietitian before the age of 12. Now, I'm not sure if that's a causative effect or a, a association, <laughs> but it demonstrates the importance of um, you know, childhood obesity also predicting, you know, where people end up, you know, in later life. And um, those are my conflicts. And, um, uh, but, <laughs> rapidly move on. <laughs> but, uh, um, suffice to say that we're interested in the shift that happened in the population. And although the shift is actually quite minor when we look at the median BMI, certainly what we are seeing is we're seeing this tail uh, this, right, uh, this, right, uh, this, right, uh, this right tail of morbidly obese patients, patients that really struggle um, because of their very heavy weights. Um, this is Swedish data dating back to 1976 to remind us, um, you know, and this is you know, for those of us um, like me who thought initially that if we just ban McDonald's we're going to save the world, uh, it probably is not going to work out because of the Swedish data in 1976 where they actually took dizygotic twins that were um, separate, even when they look at those that were separated at birth and, and raised in the north of Sweden, in the south or the east and the west, and when re you reunite the, the dizygotic twins, they've got different heights and different body mass indexes like you and your siblings vary. However, if they got monozygotic twins that were raised in completely different parts in Sweden and completely different environments, when they reunite them, unsurprisingly, they had the same hair color, they had the same height, but they also had the same body mass index. So although um, our um, set points vary between siblings, as you can see, the set points of weight um, is very similar if you are monozygotic, suggesting that the environmental influence may be less than we actually think it can be. Now that does not, that does not mean that you can change your set point maybe plus or minus three kilograms in most people, um, but it just means that we need to understand the physiology to really understand this problem. Another um, important um, aspect is this is work from Steve O'Reilly's work, a group in, um, in, uh, in Cambridge, but it also illustrates the physiology that's happening here. Here's the same boy that you know, uh, you've seen this picture many times with leptin deficiency. He has a very, very rare disorder, but he has one physiological problem. And if we actually could fix that one physiological problem by starting giving him leptin over there, that's exactly the same boy at the age of seven. So, um, and the only reason is because we changed the physiology. Now, of course, the obesity that we see in clinic is far more complex 
Um, but it illustrates the point that, you know, if we know what the problem is, we can actually treat that. And I teach my residents and say, you know, it must have been really difficult to treat hypothyroidism before we had thyroxine, because you had this complex disease and people felt tired and they felt cold and they gained weight and they had skin troubles, all these different things, but they had one physiological problem. And you can fix that, um, you actually can, can move forward. But of course, we don't understand what we're dealing with, and therefore, unsurprisingly, our treatment options are, are not, not um, always helpful. Now, just to remind you where the hypothalamus sits in the brain, and I actually <laughs> use this picture, um, and I will refer to my series of N equals 3, because it's the only people I talk to, as I said, is my children, or only, you know, children I talk to, at least. Um, and... Uh, you know, my, my son is, you know, he's sort of a mini-me, I suspect, but he's sort of very mathematical, very logical, you know, and um, he can't draw pictures for toffee. He just is unable to do any art at school. But he's quite interested. And we were walking on the university campus, and there was a mother and father that were, you know, had BMIs probably in the range of 50, and they brought their new 18-year-old daughter that probably had a BMI of about 42, you know. And my, my son looked at it and said, you know, why are those people so fat? And I... I thought about, about it for a while, and then I said, you know, um, you know what, what's, what, what I think you know, is, is probably wrong with them is that there's a part of their brain that's broken, you know, and this part just makes them feel hungry, and when they eat food, they don't feel full. And I said, you know, do you know about the part of your own brain that you think may be broken? And he thought about it for a while, and he said, yeah, probably the bit that needs to do art is broken in me, you know. So, so I said, you see, everybody has a little bit of their brain that's broken, and these people, that is the part of their brain that's not working. So if we actually approach the problem like that, then actually understanding the signaling um, may be of interest. And that's certainly looking not only at the hypothalamus, but also the reward centers um, that actually are signaling um, many of our drives to eat. Uh, if we zoom into the hypothalamus, of course, we understand that the, into the arcuate nucleus within the hypothalamus, we have the NPY neurons, we have the POMC neurons. This neuron makes you eat more and makes you do less exercise. This neuron makes you eat less and do more activity or exercise. And as you can see, here's the leptin receptor, here's the Y2 receptor where PYY binds into, and this means that these receptors are under the control of the periphery. So the periphery are talking to the center, and if we can understand how that works and the physiology of that, it actually allows us to approach the problem. And that's sort of the approach that we've taken. If the problem is here, we wanted to understand what are the peripheral signals, ghrelin making you hungry, this is peptide YY, glucagon-like peptide 1, oxymodulin that makes you reduce your food intake, leptin that controls the long term, as well as insulin that feeds in. And if we can, per if we can manipulate the periphery, we're actually using a safe pathway to actually influence the center where the problem is. And the, and the reason is because actually when we use small molecules to, to affect the center, we actually cause more havoc uh, than we actually do, do good. But why is it, so what, what is the, what's happening in the periphery in obese patients? And these are adults, uh, and what we see here is um, uh, meals that we give people, 250 calories, a small breakfast, 1,000, a good lunch, 3,000 uh, more calories than a man of my size should consume in an entire day. And of course, if you give it to lean people, the more food you give, the more hormone you get that is supposed to make you feel full. Um, so that's why we feel fuller after a thousand, well, thousand calories uh, versus 500 calories. But if you give exactly the same amount of food to obese people, what you can see is they have a functional deficiency of this hormone. So the same amount of food does not generate the same physiological, uh, same physiological response. Probably best illustrated by a thousand calories in the lean generate the same signals as 2,000 calories in the obese. And again, when I speak to my obese patients in clinic, they often will tell you, you know what, I don't feel that hungry. You know, hunger is not really a problem. I can, most often, I don't even have to eat breakfast. I wake up, I don't feel hungry for breakfast. My problem is when I start eating at lunchtime or dinner time, I can't stop. It takes me a lot of food before I feel full. And this is the physiology that may explain that. So the real benefit of that is that if we have, in endocrinology, if we have something that is low, we can supplement it. And that's what we try to do with this dose response study by actually giving different doses of PYY. This is 0.2 to 0.8. 
And the more food we give in this randomized, double-blind, controlled way, and we ask patients to then eat an ad libitum amount of food, you can see the more peptide you give them, the lower the amount of food is that they consume. And when we ask them the question on a visual analog scale, why is it that you are, um, how are you feeling after we injected this, these hormones, um, the visual analog scales tell us that they have increase in satiety as the doses increase. So changing the physiology appears to be helpful. But, you know, um, we've injected leptin into patients. Leptin is very helpful, and I showed you um, Steve O'Reilly's work in leptin-deficient patients, but most obese patients are actually leptin-resistant. They've got too much leptin. So if you give them more leptin, it doesn't work. But here we have a hormonal system where we have a deficiency, and I've already shown you um, that in lean patients, if we actually inject uh, PYY or saline, we can make people eat less food, but in obese patients where they eat more ad libitum food in a 24-hour period, um, actually because they have a deficiency when we inject them with PYY, we also have a reduction. So this works in the lean, but it also works in the obese. Why does it work in patients? Because on the PYY day, there was a reduction in appetite. So physiologically, we've affected the system, and therefore, the behavior comes naturally to people. They don't have to think about, oh, I have to be very good, I don't have to eat this or that. You know, they are just acting because of the, um, what Torsten refers to as the signals that we've been able to alter. And where do these signals work? This is a, um, a GLP-1, another gut hormone that actually, and when we use functional MRI, what we can actually see is that injecting these hormones in the periphery actually changes the brain. It changes the reward centers in the brain and therefore is consistent with what the behavior. So just to remind you of the story, if you change the periphery, you have the effects in the brain, you actually can change the behavior. If you actually start by trying to change the behavior without affecting the brain, without affecting the periphery, life is a thousand times harder, um, uh, as has been illustrated many times. Um, finally, we also talked about energy expenditure, and uh, you will remember that I talked about the acute nucleus, NPY, making you eat more, do less activity, POMC, making you eat less, do more activity, so the same system controls energy in and energy out. And this is another gut hormone, oxyntomodulin, that was, and this was work done by Katie Wynn. In our, in our lab uh, uh, when we were uh, at Imperial, uh, together with, with Steve Bloom as the principal investigator. Um, but what you can see here is um, actually when we measure total daily um, energy expenditure, um, on the days when people received oxyntomodulin, there was an increase in energy expenditure. So not only did they eat less food, they also had an increase in energy expenditure because we were able to change the signals that come from the periphery. So, of course, as an internal medicine doctor, what I want to understand is how do we affect the center um, by using the periphery um, to actually ultimately change food and take an energy expenditure. And that's why, you know, I'm so excited um, about the impact of surgery. Um, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But, um, you know, I, I always say to Torsten, you know, the surgeons um, found the answer without understanding the question. You know, so um, now what I'm trying to do is to back engineer the thing uh, by actually using this fantastic model um, to actually understand how the periphery can change the center um, so that we can help people in future. So just to thank people and also specifically in Gothenburg, uh, Torsten and Lasse um, and all the others that have been so good. Thank you very much.